More high arctic fossil finds speak of the youth of the fossils, and we dive into an extended play mailbag responding to a boatload of viewer comments and questions. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and of course, carried on the Christianima Network, Christianima.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in power broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. The Bible does not say, be ye transformed by the removal of your mind. Rather, we here at Genesis Week believe your brain was intelligently designed, and God wants you to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com, and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. I had a pile of viewers write in about a fun fossil find from the Canadian High Arctic. The Canadian Museum of Nature launched an expedition to Ellesmere Island, where they found a fossil camel. Not just any camel, but a giant camel. Some 30% larger than modern camels, or probably around 10 feet tall. Now, while this may be surprising to many people, it's not surprising to you, because you watch this show, and we've discussed it all before on this show. Gigantic animals in the fossil record is common, and in fact, my good buddy Joe Taylor excavated a fossil camel in West Texas that he estimated was about 19 feet tall. We find fossil armadillos six feet long, dragonflies with one meter or three foot wingspans, Moose standing around 12 feet tall at the shoulders, and plants of enormous sizes. Plants like the club moss, which today might grow to maybe, maybe mm, 16 inches tall here in Ontario. We find the same plant in the fossil record with a trunk one meter in diameter and up to 120 feet, 35 meters tall. Now, this fossil camel, and pretty much all fossil life, shows that we have been de-evolving. We've lost something. We've lost size and stature. Now, of course, most people associate camels with the Sahara Desert, not the Canadian North Pole. But if you recall from our Breaking the Ice episode, though the Canadian High Arctic may be a white winter wasteland right now, we find buried in the ice and mud a wild array of animals. Mammoths and mastodons, horses, rhinoceros, lion, leopard, bear, tiger, reindeer, giant beaver, the musk sheep, musk ox, donkey, and a whack of other animals that do not live in the Arctic today. Now add another camel to that list, as camels had been found in the high Arctic before. Mike Ord contrasted the variety of animals found in the high Arctic. The only similar diversity of mammals is on the Serengeti of East Africa. You'll remember a couple of episodes back, we went into a number of examples of soft tissues uh, and even living organisms being found in the fossil record. Well, this camel provided still yet another example, as collagen fibers were found in these camel bones. It all speaks of the youthfulness of the fossils. The camel fossil hasn't been dated with carbon-14, as they've assigned it an age of some 3.5 million years old. And I predict that if they ran carbon-14 tests on those bones, they would be found to have lots of carbon-14 still in it, and a radiocarbon age that'll be like 1 one-hundredth of the assigned age of 3.5 million years old. Now, we're told that the Greenland ice sheet represents at least 100,000 years of accumulated snow and ice. 
which would be a problem for the biblical age for the earth of a mere 6,000 years old. Yet many of those fossils found in the high Arctic return carbon-14 dates of a mere four to 5,000 years old. Are we to believe that the high Arctic had an animal population as diverse as the Serengeti, the high Arctic of Canada, Alaska, and Siberia, yet Greenland was somehow buried under a kilometer of ice? Again, it all just points to the ages assigned to the Greenland ice sheet being quite young, and everything about these fossils speaks of youth. Thank you to all of you who have watched the show. Because Genesis Week is still quite new on the airwaves, we still don't have solid numbers on viewership yet. But based on the feedback we got, the viewership is apparently surprisingly high. For me personally, I was not expecting to see the responses we've gotten for at least a year or two down the road. Instead, you guys, as we say in Canada, have blown me away with your response. Thanks to all of you who have taken the time to write in. I wish I could read every single email or repeat every comment I've gotten, but alas, I just cannot. Uh, we appreciate those of you who have taken the time to uphold myself and the show in prayer as well, as that is needed. Uh, I hate to say it, but we need your financial support as well. I don't like to bring it up, but the reality is television is expensive. Any way you cut it. This program has a huge outreach and we are continually getting new viewers tuning in. Now, while we can offer a tax deductible receipt to Canadians as Core Ottawa sponsors the show, we cannot offer anyone else a tax deduction yet. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a 501c3 in the US, but that could take up to a year before that gets into place. If you've appreciated the show, please consider financially supporting it. We operate much like PBS. We are a viewer supported program. We have a couple of sponsors, which does help, but you, our viewers, are our main support. And please don't underestimate what a simple donation of $10 can do. Uh, if only a few thousand of our viewers each gave $10, then we wind up finding the entire season really quickly. Though those who have been so kind to donate 100 and some even $1,000 have been the mainstay of keeping the show on the air. You can help support the show donating to Core Ottawa, or uh, I know people had asked how you could just simply send a gift online. The details are here and at the end of the show. And thank you for your support, not just financially, but in prayer and in watching. Uh, we know that there's a lot of competition out there for your viewership, so we certainly appreciate that you chose to watch Genesis Week. Speaking of our sponsors, we'll be right back after this short break with an extended mailbag as we try to wade through the backlog of viewer comments and questions. This show is sponsored in part by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum at bvcsm.com. And by Genesis Park, where you can pre-order your own beautiful hard-covered copy of the Chronicles of Dinosauria, the history and mystery of dinosaurs and man. Funny, Fast and Furious. Ian's Crevo rants cover a multitude of topics in an easy-to-understand, comical way. Complicated subjects that normally make your brain hurt hurt a lot less when Ian explains them while wearing his anti-government mind-reading equipment. Have questions about carbon-14 dating, natural selection, thermodynamics, or... What on earth is he doing there? Three volumes of rants on DVD. Take your pick for $15 each, plus shipping and handling, or order all three as a package and save yourself 10 bucks. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. Woohoo! Mail for me? Because we've gone a couple weeks without a mailbag, I thought I'd do an extended play version of viewer feedback this week. Again, thanks to all of you who took the time to write in, uh, especially to the person who anonymously sent me the pre-programmed killer robot armed with anti-personnel missiles. Uh, he missed, but sure made a mess in my kitchen. You'll recall several weeks back, Oren from Colorado wrote in, challenging those who claim that dinosaurs and humans never lived at the same time to prove it. Well, Lauren, 
I'm sad to say I did not get a single attempt by anyone to prove that dinosaurs and humans never lived at the same time. I will, however, go into detail in a special episode of Genesis Week on the astonishing evidence that dinosaurs and humans most certainly did live at the same time. In our Toad You So episode, we talked about the incredible number of finds of not only soft tissues, such as bone marrow, blood vessels, and blood cells in dinosaur bones, we then went on to discover living bacteria and even living toads in rocks allegedly 400 million years old and older. Uh, we were overwhelmed with comments from that episode, both interest and criticism. YouTuber Dukunjinsh, however you say that, wrote in, By far one of your best shows ever. The soft tissue in the blood proves without a doubt that it cannot be millions of years old, but then the hibernated frogs just blew my socks off. Keep doing God's work, Ian. Genesis Week keeps getting better and better. And also, thanks for slowing down for all of us slow thinkers. Don wrote in from Ontario, Ian, toad bee or not toad bee? Would hibernating toads not be a strong suggestion that there was not an ice age? How cold can the toads become before their cell structures burst? Not much below zero, I would suspect. An ice age would deep freeze the ground, killing the toads, no doubt cracking the sedimentary layers more than we see. Excellent question, Don. In northern Ontario, around the south shores of Hudson's Bay, for example, where the frogs and toads hibernate, of course, for many months during the winter, they bury themselves in very sh fairly shallow areas, which do stoop down well below the freezing temperatures, and they survive just fine. Furthermore, there was much, much more to the subject of torpid toads that I didn't get into. I mean, I, I only provided a couple of examples. There were many, many reports. Uh, of interest to your question was another one of the reports by Lindsay Williams, writing in 1980 of his experiences and observations as chaplain to the Alaskan pipeline construction crews in the 1970s. He wrote, However, on this particular day, a man whom I personally know to be very reliable came to me and said something like this. Chaplain, you won't believe this, but we were digging in this gravel pit on the Sag River, quite a number of feet under the surface depth. We brought to the surface what looked like a big Louisiana bullfrog. We brought it out into the building and allowed it to thaw out. As I say, what was then told to me is hard to believe. However, let me point out that the frog is a cold-blooded mammal, and that in the winter season, it does go into a virtual state of deep freeze, much like the hibernation associated with bears and other Arctic animals. This man described the way in which the frog was left there and then thawed out. He claimed they actually watched as it totally thawed, and then it quite perceptibly moved. In fact, it appeared to be alive with those perceptible movements taking place for several minutes. Then the movement ceased, and the man threw the frog away. Of course, it would have been better if they had kept it and had the story both witnessed and properly authenticated. Nevertheless, I mention it as an incident that was accepted by others as actually taking place. I have no reason to doubt it. So, this was a recent report, only from the 70s, of a phenomena that has been seen apparently all over the world. Now, I actually did some study on the permafrost depths on the north shore of Alaska where this report came from. And the permafrost can go down hundreds of feet or more, then thaw out in the summertime. So, obviously, the frog was frozen pretty good. And from the description of the depth where it was dug out, it was probably there from the time of Noah's flood. Several skeptics wrote in with some pretty consistent, albeit ridiculous, Criticisms. Several skeptics wrote in, as well as some comments about the show on some blogs, saying that I provided no references to the scientific literature for the reports of soft tissues in fossils and living organisms. Um, I, I, I don't know what show you were watching, but the references were right there on the screen. Lots and lots of them. The show is uploaded to YouTube the day after it airs on television, so you can go and look for yourself. And in fact, I even provide all the references I use in the show in the description of the video on YouTube, complete with hyperlinks. 
Other skeptics chimed in about how Dr. Mary Schweitzer's find of blood vessels and blood cells in a T-Rex bone was just modern slime coating the inside of fossilized blood vessels. Well, actually, Dr. Schweitzer herself had already addressed this and falsified it years ago. I mentioned this in one of my past newsletters. If the soft, stretchy blood vessels were actually modern day slime that had grown inside fossil blood vessels, then the slime would be more thicker at the bottom of the tube than the top. And you wouldn't expect to be able to take tweezers, squeeze these tubes like a tube of toothpaste, and have red globs come out that sure look like red blood cells. But let's give the skeptics that argument and say that Schweitzer was wrong. Excellent! How do you respond to the many other reports of dinosaur meat, blood cells, and soft stretchy tissues? Reports which date back to 1923 and as recently as last month, with report coming out from the Creation Research Society's iDino project finding the same things in a triceratops horn. And let's ignore all that. I'm certain that if we take one of those living toads that was released from solid rock, allegedly 400 million years old, five times the alleged age of those dinosaurs, I'm pretty certain that if we cut open those living toads, we would find blood, blood vessels, and soft tissues like meat. I'm pretty certain. I couldn't help but notice that, except for one rude skeptic on the Genesis Week Facebook page, no one lifted a finger to attempt to address the finding of living organisms in allegedly old rocks. You know, living organisms like bacteria, toads, frogs, and clams, all still alive in Ordovician rocks alleged to be older than 400 million years old. The only comment we received was from one rude skeptic who promptly got banned from our Facebook page, criticizing people for believing the reports because they were from the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, why would anybody believe anything from the 1800s? I mean, they knew nothing about science, right? As predicted, we got a boatload of viewer feedback on our two episodes examining the dark side of Darwin. Because humans are communal animals who survive and prosper through cooperation, survival of the fittest could just as well mean those who work most effectively with others. However, even granting the idea that evolution is a cruel process, it is in many cases, it doesn't do anything to show that evolution isn't real. Cruel does not equal false. You sure are one terrible person, Ian, and a bad Christian as well. Responding to the critics on YouTube, Warblerito wrote in, Denying the very real social Darwinism phenomena in our recent and current history is voluntary ignorance. Maybe your ears are stopped up by the anti-religious hipster religion. The moral implications wrought from an evolutionary mindset have been used to justify atrocities simple and documented. Did you not hear the quote from your own precious Richard Dawkins? Did you even watch this video? Don't be a victim of pop culture the same way you already know not to be a victim of Fox News. I've stated multiple times that it's irrelevant what the theory of evolution actually states. The main point is what people believe once they believe evolution is true. And a lot of times people start to believe that life is meaningless. People that commit suicide. Others believe that they are higher evolved and less inferior than others. Hitler and the Columbine kids. Either way, the point is that people draw these conclusions from the belief that evolution is true. Quote, if a person goes on a shooting rampage and claims that Jesus Christ told them to do it, they would find difficulty justifying their claim, end quote, and so on, basically saying they would be misinterpreting the Bible. Then you go and misinterpret survival of the fittest, especially when it comes to mankind, because you know full well when it comes to mankind, the fittest were those with the characteristics of working together. Such profound dishonesty. You should be ashamed, sir. <laughs> dishonesty my foot. Even Richard Dawkins didn't make the false claim you're making now. He knew better and even acknowledged the connection as much as he didn't like it. Trolling with Reason also chimed in along the same lines. The serial killer Bind, Torture, Kill was a church-going Christian. Further, Christianity in no way prevents Catholic priests from raping little boys. A lot fewer dots can connect Christianity to child-molesting priests and ministers, along with the churches that bury the information to protect their image. 
It's interesting you guys bring this up. As I stated in the show, anybody can perform wicked deeds, but that person would have a hard time justifying their murderous activity in the name of Christ, seeing as how Christ cited the law, which states, thou shalt not murder, and if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. As for Catholic priests raping little boys, what I find interesting here is the embellishment that has gone on over this scandal. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops studied the abuse and concluded that 10,667 young people were sexually mistreated, not necessarily physically molested or raped, between 1950 and 2002. That's 52 years of data. In 2004, the U.S. Department of Education commissioned a study examining physical sexual abuse by public school employees between 1991 and 2000, a mere nine years. The study revealed a staggering 290,000 students experienced some sort of physical sexual abuse, and 40% of the abusers were female. So just the female sexual abusers in the public schools alone, in one year, committed more acts of sexual abuse than 52 years of abuse by all Catholic priests combined. Now, of course, you understand I condemn such behavior, but clearly faith inhibits this behavior, whereas in the public schools, God is not allowed. Evolution is taught as fact, and you are not even allowed to question evolution. No one is claiming that Jesus Christ would approve of molesting and raping children. You reap what you sow. One of us is better than the other. One of us has the desired beneficial traits needed for human survival. One of us should procreate and the other should be sterilized to prevent the passing on of undesired traits and the ongoing deterioration of human DNA. This is the grim reality of evolution. These last two videos have been purely appeals to consequence. Even if it were true that every bad thing ever done were because of evolution, it would not affect its validity. Appeals to consequence most certainly. The consequences of belief in evolution. So the question arises, is evolution true or not? We are reaping what we have sown, and one of those consequences we are seeing, as we discussed and showed in the program, is that proper scientific study, which shows that evolution is invalid scientifically, has been hindered by evolutionary theory. I'm disappointed. You didn't address the claims that Hitler was a creationist, and your argument was a vague hand wave that Hitler claimed to be a Christian, but didn't believe it. Well, it certainly was not hand waving. You can read Hitler's table talk for yourself, as the book has been translated and is available freely on the, on the web. He was clear on his views of evolutionism, which he called science. And you can read specific quotes like, The heaviest blow that ever struck humanity was the coming of Christianity. Bolshevism is Christianity's illegitimate child. Both are inventions of the Jew. The deliberate lie in the matter of religion was introduced into the world by Christianity. So it's not opportune to hurl ourselves now into a struggle with the churches. The best thing is to let Christianity die a natural death. A slow death has something comforting about it. The dogma of Christianity gets worn away before the advances of science. Religion will have to make more and more concessions. Gradually, the myths crumble. All that's left is to prove that in nature there is no frontier between the organic and inorganic. When understanding of the universe has become widespread, when the majority of men know that the stars are not sources of light but worlds, perhaps inhabited worlds like ours, then the Christian doctrine will be convicted of absurdity. Hitler's hypocrisies were evident, and he was forward about his specific tactics. Peter added to this, writing in from an undisclosed location in Europe, Interesting. I would disagree with Dr. Bergman's statement, though, that Hitler didn't fight a war against Christianity. Hitler murdered every Christian theologian he didn't agree with. Bonhoeffer, for example, even changed the theology. Additionally, there was a concentration camp in Niederhagen near the occult hotspot Webelisberg Castle, specifically for Bible scholars and Jehovah's Witnesses. The point being, Jesus warned us to judge by the fruit. 
You cannot criticize these various people for their atrocities, as they were simply following the mantra of evolution. They were consistent with what they believed. The sexual abusers and those who murdered in the name of Christ were not consistent with the faith they claimed to hold. But Jesus warned us against asking about the evils of others. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall also likewise perish. Jesus warned us repeatedly of judgment to come. Forget about what others have done. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, this isn't some competition to see who's the most holiest, because you will not be judged compared to others. You will be judged by God's standard. Look at the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied? You just fell short of God's commandment. Have you always held your parents in honor? No? Uh, that's another one. Have you ever used God's name in vain or the name of Jesus in vain as a swear word? Uh-oh, that's a biggie. I don't care how righteous you appear to be to people. Congratulations, you have fallen short of God's standard and you are worthy of God's judgment. You will not be allowed into the new heaven and new earth. And there is only one other place to inherit, the lake of fire, which was never intended for people but for Satan and his fallen angels. That is why Jesus came, lived a perfect sinless life, and took the wrath of God in your place. But you need to repent, which means to turn from your sinful ways and live your life in place of Christ, who died for you. You no longer own yourself anymore, but you now belong to Christ. Jesus called this being born again, and it's simple. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and confess this publicly, giving your life and living your life for Him. Why don't you do that today? Well, that's it for this week's show. Thanks again for choosing to watch Genesis Week. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. You can send in your comments, questions, and information for your offshore bank accounts to comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at Genesis Week, or you can go to genesisweek.com, which is our YouTube channel, or you can also post a comment to our Facebook page. Let us remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter, detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org.